Let's pray again together. Oh, Lord God of the harvest, now in this moment, we ask that you would water the hearts of each one who will hear your word. Lord of the harvest, cause me and all those who hear now in this moment to behold you in the light of faith now so that we can behold you in the fullness of glory soon hereafter. O Lord, in this hour as I preach, may I exalt thee and humble sinners. Do your work of grace in all of our hearts so that the seed which is sown in weakness may be raised in power by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Two scriptures to read together. We'll end up in James chapter 1, verse 1, but first I want to read together from Mark chapter 6. The reading is from Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, and we will find the name of James, the same guy, here in Mark chapter 6, and then we'll see his name a second time in James chapter 1, verse 1. But let's begin in Mark 6. A little story from the life of Jesus, and it says in Mark 6, he went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Verse 3, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? and are not his sisters right here with us. And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. And then our primary text today is James chapter 1, verse 1. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Every time I watch a show on my iPad, or every time I listen to a podcast on my iPhone, I'm thankful for that little arrow that's a circle with a number 30 inside of it because I can skip ahead through a scene that I don't want to watch 30 seconds at a time or if the podcast is talking about something that I don't care about, I can skip ahead 30 seconds at a time. If we're honest, when we're studying the Bible, these little verses at the beginning of the epistles are when we're tempted to hit that little forward button because this is just sort of fly over, get not yet into the good stuff kind of territory in the epistles. But actually, I want to tell you that this morning, James chapter 1 verse 1 is filled with something that is richly applicable because it's going to give us a two-part outline which perfectly describes the attitude that every member of this church must have. This verse is going to explain for us and demonstrate for us the attitude, the heart attitude that every member of this church ought to have. And I'll give you the two-part outline and you'll understand how important this is. The two things that this is going to show us that should be our attitude, the very air that we breathe, is first, a low view of of self. And second, a high view of our Savior. A low view of self and a high view of the Savior. And we'll see that together here in James 1, 1. So we meet this guy, James. We see his name there as the first word in the verse, and we read his name back in Mark chapter 6. So as we introduce ourselves to James, let's just ask two quick questions. First, what is the, who is James according to the Bible? And second, maybe more importantly, who is James according to himself? 
First, who is James according to the Bible? Well, the first thing to say is that our English word that's uh, one syllable, James, it disguises the fact that he bears the name of the great patriarch, Jacob. That's his name. And we also know from Mark chapter 6 that James was the brother of the Lord Jesus. Or we could say half-brother because they had the same mother but not the same father, Joseph only being Jesus' earthly father. But it says in Matthew 13 and also in Mark 6 that James was the brother of Jesus growing up in his household. We also know from the book of Acts, we're in the book of Acts in our ABFs, maybe you just came, I hope you just came from there. You're going to see in the book of Acts that James is the leader of the most important foundational church in the book of Acts, which is the church at Jerusalem. It goes so far as in Galatians chapter 2 to say James is the pillar of the church at Jerusalem. So this is who James is according to the rest of the Bible. Question, who is James according to himself? James, a servant, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James had a low view of himself. He calls himself a slave the word doulos from the verb uh, to bind, like with chains or with ropes. The doulos, the slave, the bond servant, the will of the servant was bound to the will of the master. The slave is seen not as an hourly employee who chooses to do what he wants. The slave is seen as the property of the master. The slave lived to do the master's will. In other words, James, the bondservant, is saying that he has wholly surrendered his will to the will of his master, God, the Lord Jesus Christ. A servant is what he calls himself. Other people called him the pillar of the church of Jerusalem, but James calls himself a bond slave of Jesus. You ever get into an argument and later you think of what you could have said? I'm sure this happens to you. You're arguing with somebody about who's going to win a football game or politics or whatever you like to argue about, and you make uh, two points in your little argument with them, but then after you go home, when you're no longer in the presence of the person you were arguing with, oh man, do you think of five perfect points that you should have made in the argument, and we all regret what we should have said or what we could have said. What James could have said James an apostle James not just an apostle but the pillar of the most important church in the New Testament era oh and not only that but James an apostle and a pillar and James the guy who has known Jesus longer than any of y'all He's like, I played shoots and ladders with him. We grew up together. All of this he could have said. But your Bible says James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. The mark of the greatest man of God is that he has a low view of self and a high view of the Savior. The mark of the godly woman is that she has a low view of herself and a remarkably, joyously exalted view of her Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It has been said that the truly great man never thinks that he's great and the truly small man never thinks that he's small. <laughs> Let that sink in. The truly great man never thinks that he's great. And the truly small man never thinks that he's small. Human pride, which is the only way that we see with the eyes of our flesh, is a hall of mirrors. And it's like a distortion of everything that's true about us and the people around us. Humility, 
the clarity of humility, particularly the clarity of humility in a leader is a precious quality. Here we have James saying, I'm a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's all he says, leaving out all the other letters that he could have piled behind his name. A low view of self. Here's a question that not enough of us ask, not enough of the time. The question is simply, well, I guess I want to be a servant. I guess I want to be humble. How can I tell if I have a servant attitude? That's the question that not enough of us ask, not enough of the time. The question is, how can I tell if I have a servant attitude? And the answer to that question is surprisingly simple. The answer to the question, how can I tell if I have a servant attitude, is surprisingly simple. It's this, by the way you react when people treat you like a servant. That's the only way that you know. The way you react when you're treated like a slave, when you're treated like nothing. James identified himself as a slave. Man, we don't get that. The only thing we angle for is our rights. We're obsessed with our number of followers, our number of likes, our number of streaks or whatever it is. Not so James. Not so the other blessed and, and, and uh, most effective and fruitful apostle, the apostle Paul. He says in 1 Corinthians 3, yeah, I did this and James did that and, see, and somebody else did that, but only God caused the things that matter. Only God. A low view of self and a high view of the Savior. This is what we need. That it's not about my name. It's not about how many people notice me. It's just about doing the will of the master. I wish more of us would capture the precious, uh, the precious reality of the Christian poet, Barbara Ryberg. She wrote, I do not ask for mighty words to leave the crowd impressed, but grant my life may ring so true that one neighbor may be blessed. I do not ask for influence to sway the multitude. Give me a word in season for one soul in solitude. I ask no place of prominence where all the world can see, but in some needy corner, Lord, there let me work for thee. True humility and a servant's heart, a low view of self. I want to expand on this. And so in this area of the low view of self, I actually have kind of three sub points. Many of you are enraged at me at my inability to outline. And I in turn dislike you because all you care about are outlines. But in my effort to try to try to do something decent, I'll give you an A, B, C under this first point. So a low view of self. And then A is this, a servant is humble enough to sound like Jesus. A servant is humble enough to sound like Jesus. This week as I was preparing this sermon, I was reading a uh, very boring academic book about the, it, like it was, it's an introduction about the dates and geography and all of this. The title of this book, this is how boring it is, is A Technical Introduction to the Non-Pauline Epistles of the New Testament. I didn't delight or enjoy in reading this book. It was boring. In fact, my experience in reading this book is a lot like your experience when I preach too long and my head began to make that southward migration, you know, and but as I was reading this book that I didn't really like, oh, I came across these two sentences that I just stopped and I just almost hollered out to God, this is what I want to be. Because the two sentences that I came across was this. This book summarizes how James teaches by saying this. James, the epistle of James contains more reminiscences and verbal resemblances to the teachings of Jesus than all of the other New Testament epistles put together. The epistle of James contains more reminiscences and verbal resemblances to the teachings of Jesus than all of the other New Testament epistles put together. Then the second sentence was this, James seems to be so soaked in the specifics of Jesus' teaching that he reflects Jesus' teaching almost unconsciously. In other words, James isn't reaching for quotations from the teaching of Jesus to sprinkle in his letter. Rather, James has been with Jesus for so long, 
and so lovingly and he has lingered in the presence of his Savior for so many hours that when he speaks, he sounds like Jesus. He's not trying to. He just does. Man, I want that to be me. I wish I knew the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I wish I knew them so thoroughly that, that when I talked about people or when I visited people or when I prayed for people or when I commented on the news of the day, it sounded like Jesus. James isn't even trying to sound like Jesus. He just sounds like him. Years ago, uh, it was actually probably the, the first year that we moved here. Uh, I, I had a, like a conference budget and I went to a pastor's conference at a huge church that has a very popular pastor. And I had never been there before. I had never met this mega popular pastor. And so in the first session, we sang a hymn and then he came up to welcome us and give announcements. And I'm sitting in the back and I've never met this pastor. I probably have a little picture of him on all of his books that I have on my shelf. But sure enough, as the announcements are given, it it's, sounds exactly like this pastor. It's him. And I'm looking from the back and he doesn't quite look like I expected him to look. And he welcomes us and gives the announcements. Then he gets down and we sing another hymn. And then lo and behold, the actual pastor gets up to preach the message. The first guy wasn't even the pastor that I thought he was, but he sounded just like him. Why? Well, probably because he's been his associate pastor and like his best friend for 25 years. And so without trying to sound like him, he sounds like him. That line from that boring technical introductory book, James seems to be so soaked in the specifics of Jesus' teaching that he reflects it almost unconsciously. How I want that to be me. Do you agree that we have just about enough people who sound like their favorite political commentator? Do you agree that we have just about enough people who sound like this or that funny person or celebrity or whatever? Oh, for church members who sound like Jesus. A servant is humble enough to sound like Jesus. That's A, B. A servant is humble enough to say what needs to be said. A servant is humble enough to say what needs to be said. And if you read the epistle of James, you will realize that this is an epistle written by a guy who is unafraid to say what needs to be said. James does not write with the subtlety of a poet. James writes with the stubby bluntness of a two by four. That's the way he, he just says what needs to be said. James sounds a lot like Jesus, who sounds a lot like John the Baptist, who sounded a lot like the Old Testament prophets. And so when we read James, we have this echo from the Old Testament prophets through John the Baptist, through Jesus, into James, because the, the Old Testament prophets all the way through, they railed against injustice. They spoke up when the poor were being mistreated and abused. They made bold assertions and strong condemnations. And if you threatened to cut their head off, they only spoke louder. Well, James does this. When you're reading it, you get the sense that this guy is an acute observer of human nature and that when he sees humans being mistreated, he says something every time. Are you the kind of person that when you see something, if you see an injustice, you have to step in and fix it? Or are you the kind of person who's like, well, let's not get involved, right? Married couples, often one is one and one is the other. Or maybe you have a friend, like, and you're together and you, you're, you witness an injustice. Maybe something as small as somebody has 19 items in their shopping cart and they're only supposed to have 15. Or maybe someone, you know, that's mistreated in a business or maybe even something more significant than that. And so 
one of you, the, the when I see something, I have to say something person is like, oh, I can't let that stand. And they just start, you know, going. And the other person is like grabbing an elbow. No, 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 no. This is not our fight. Let's not get involved. You know, which, which one are you? James was the one who always moved forward into the situation. Now, I suppose, not I suppose, it can be pride and an inflated sense of self that makes you jump forward to do something and say something. But certainly, I hope you would agree with me, it could also be profound humility that would cause you to step forward and say something. Because the fear of consequence is gone from your life for you because you have a Christ-like concern for justice in the situation. So it could be humility that doesn't fear man and that doesn't fear consequences that makes you want to see something and say something. And James says what needs to be said, in particular to the wealthy. And it, it, it just stands to reason, right? If you could pick one group to like not turn into your enemy, it would be the powerful and the wealthy. And James goes right at them time and time and time again. Why? Because he is humble enough to say what needs to be said. He brooks no fools and he has no time for artificial flim flam that says one thing and does another. He's humble enough to deal with things the way they need to be dealt with. Well, that's B and then C under this low view of self is simply this, a servant is humble enough to surrender all. A servant is humble enough to surrender all. By using the term bond slave, James is saying, uh, I have absolutely surrendered my will to the will of my master. I have surrendered myself to Jesus. I'm willing to go where he tells me to go. I'm willing to say what he tells me to say. I'm willing to pay what he tells me to pay. Essentially, it means that he has made the one choice that forecloses all of the choices. Now I know who I am, I know whose I am, and this is, this is the life that I've got now. You remember 1 Corinthians 6, five words out of verse nine. Pick out these five words with me. It says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? You are not your own. For you have been bought with a price, so glorify God with your body. Those five words, tiny words, only three or four letters each. You are not your own. A servant is humble enough to surrender all. Because a servant finally understands that I'm not my own. A slave is not... Uh, on someone's payroll to do his or her own thing sometimes and the master's will sometimes. The slave is not his own. He belongs wholly and completely to the master. You know the best description of this, it's, it's pretty famous throughout recent church history, is the wonderful line from C.T. Studd. You know who C.T. Studd was? If you don't know who C.T. Studd was, um, you should. He was a, a world-class athlete. The only problem that we don't relate is because he played cricket. Here in America, we play baseball and football and we eat chili dogs and Pepsi. In England, they play cricket and they have tea and crumpets. But regardless of the difference, this guy, C.T. Studd, he graduated from Cambridge. He's a, he's a top scholar, but he's also like just the best cricketer, a cricket player that there is. And he leaves that to become a missionary and serve Jesus, I think first in India and then in the Sudan and then in the Belgian Congo. It would be exactly like if Patrick Mahomes wins today and tomorrow press conference. I'm leaving the NFL. I picked the neediest uh, place in Southeast Asia and I'm going to live there and serve the poor there in the name of Jesus with bread and water and the bread of life, the gospel for the rest of my life. This is what C.T. Studd did. 
And nobody could believe it. The English press couldn't believe it. And so they asked him, why do you do this? And this is his answer. This is his answer. I had known about Jesus dying for me, but I had never really understood that if he had died for me, then I no longer belonged to me. Redemption means buying back so that now that I belong to Jesus, either I had to be a thief and keep what was no longer mine or else I had to give up everything for him. A servant is humble enough to surrender all, to surrender all for Jesus. That's what it is. That's making the choice that forecloses all other choices. That's surrendering to Jesus and leaving no other options open. Are we not addicted to keeping our options open? Does not Jesus, the Lord and Savior, tell us with all of the love in his heart, the more options you keep open, the quicker is your path to hell. Shut all doors. I'm the only one. Follow me. Make the one choice that forecloses all other choices. So I can no longer say, I can do what I want. I can say, I do what Jesus wants me to do. Uh, applicable in our day, I can no longer say, well, the world says this about sex and this about gender and this about money and this about power. So I can think this about sex and gender and money and power. No. My only option is to say, the Lord Jesus Christ has said this about those things. That's the only thing that I hear. Have you come to the place in your life where you're willing to say, God, what the world says no longer matters to me. God, what my weak heart wants to do no longer matters to me. God, the only thing that matters to me is I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. I belong to Jesus. You know, and the amazing thing about it, those of you who are long in the Savior's service, you know this, the amazing thing about it is that freedom comes only on the backside of that surrender. So many people who haven't, who haven't surrendered to Jesus they are trying to grasp freedom with all of their might and they have none. But it's when you surrender to Jesus, the freedom comes on the other side of that. With all of the love in his heart, it is the Lord Jesus who said the, the only seed that bears fruit is the seed that dies in the ground. This is the only pathway to freedom. Make me a captive Lord, and then I shall be free. Make me a captive Lord, and then I shall be free. Force me to render up my sword, then I shall conquer or be. My will is not my own till thou hast made it thine. If it would reach the monarch's throne, it must its crown resign. This is the only pathway to freedom in life is slavery to Jesus. That's the first, a low view of self. But the second from James 1.1 1, 1 is, of course, a high view of the Savior. And these are, the, these are these precious words, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. The dispersion, again, if you're, you're in ABF, as, as we go through Acts, we, we probably haven't hit it yet, but we're going to hit it just in the next couple of weeks. The dispersion is narrated in the book of Acts. What happens in Acts is powerful gospel preaching, and then likewise, so to speak, a powerful persecution. And when the powerful preaching brings on a powerful persecution, then the church is dispersed. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. You'll see it in Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 9. It keeps, it keeps recurring throughout Acts. But what he says here, as far as his view of the Savior, is he says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, James is not going to mention the Lord Jesus Christ very much in the balance of the letter. When we, when we launch out of 1-1, one, one, 
we're going to go right into all of these practical subjects. James really does read like it's out of uh, the, the debates that we're having today in the public square. Generosity, justice, uh, income, poverty, all of that stuff. And he, and he has a lot to say about all of that. But look from the very beginning, everything that he says about every one of those issues is grounded in this, the lordship of Jesus Christ. And the first command of our master, the Lord Jesus Christ, is this. This is God's commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. By mentioning God and the Lord Jesus Christ, James is emphasizing the deity of Jesus. This very verse in James 1.1 was used by the earliest council of the church to uh, fight against the heresy of the Arians and establish the deity of Jesus Christ from Scripture. And you know, he's called Jesus. This is his human name. The, the, the Hebrew name Joshua, meaning salvation, you will call his name Jesus, for he'll save his people from their sins. He's Jesus Christ. Christos, Christos is the Greek rendering of the Hebrew word Messiah in Matthew 2, and, I mean in Psalm 2 and in many other places. So he's Jesus, he's this human being, and he's Christ, he's the one promised from heaven to come and save us. And finally, he is Lord. Lord is the translation in the Greek of the Hebrew name Yahweh, which speaks of God's unapproachable sovereignty. The term Lord occurs 14 times in the epistle of James because the Lord Jesus is the one who tells us everything that we're to think and everything that we're to do. The call of the gospel is to proclaim the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now I want to tell you one more thing about James, which is so, it's kind of so obvious, but I bet you haven't thought about it. And I bet you wouldn't think about it unless we took a minute and laid it out. And the one more thing that I want to tell you about James is this. There was a time, not, not too long before he wrote this, when James wasn't a Christian when James didn't believe in the Lord Jesus. James knew about the Lord Jesus, but he wasn't a follower of the Lord Jesus. It's in John chapter 7, depending how you date the, the feasts that are mentioned in John. I take John chapter 7 from my dating of, of the way he lays out the calendar. I take John chapter 7 as like six months before the crucifixion. And it says in John 7, his brother, James, did not yet believe in Jesus. James knew about Jesus, but he hadn't followed him. He hadn't believed in him. Well, what happened to push James across the line from knowing about Jesus to actually following Jesus as his lifelong servant? What happened was Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and Jesus rose again. And the death and resurrection of Jesus changed everything. The resistance melted. The unbelief was, was ev evaporated like the fog in the morning. And saving faith was all that was to be found in the spirit and in the soul of James. He crossed the line from not believing to believing when Jesus Christ crucified his savior, was risen as Lord, and he encountered him for real. Now, J James, he ended up loving Jesus so much that church historians tell us that James died a martyr's death. Uh, Eusebius says that J they threw James off the pinnacle of the temple, and after his body was shattered on the ground and he was dead, then the soldiers came in and pulverized his shattered body because they hated him so much. There's another precious little truth from James' life. This comes from the ancient writer Hegesippus. If, that's a great baby name, by the way. If you are expecting, I, get with me afterward, I can give you the spelling. Hegesippus gives us this precious description of James. It's famous. He says that he, uh, he says that James had the knees of a camel. 
He had the most worn out knees of any one in the New Testament period. And he wasn't insulting his anatomy. He was saying that James' knees were worn out calloused because he spent his life bowing before and praying to Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. Now, the reason I mention that is simply this. I have people who do not follow the Lord Jesus Christ yet. And I know you do too. Maybe they know about Jesus, but they're not yet his slave. They're not yet his follower. James went from knowing about Jesus and not believing him to become a follower of Jesus who died for Jesus and who wore out his knees worshiping Jesus. I believe with all the authority of this living book of God that the people in my heart who don't know Jesus yet, the people in your heart who don't know Jesus yet, some of them will end up giving their life for Jesus gladly. Because everything changes in the cross and the resurrection and the spirit-given conversion of the human soul. This is, this, is, this is the vision and mission of the church. To make disciples of Jesus Christ the Lord. That's all we do. That's why we preach. That's why we sing. That's why... This year, Lord willing, we want to expand space for our children and for our youth. This is the only reason why. Because Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. And all we want to do is call more people to serve him because we have become convinced that the only way to freedom is to bow the knee to Jesus Christ. May God grant that this church continues to do that for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord of the harvest, water the seed of your perfect and holy word preached in weakness and yet by your spirit bring about wonderful conversion and wonderful fruitfulness in in the ministry of making disciples of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Amen.